me and turn in them to Genesis chapter 10, excuse me, 11. Last week we were in Genesis chapter 10, and it's in that passage that you hear of this multiplicity of lands, this multiplicity of people, languages, tribes, tongues, and now we come to Genesis 11, and there's one people with one language in one land, and so the question is, is what is the author seeking to do, and the idea is, is that he's taken an artful approach to show you how that dispersion took place. So he shows you the dispersion, and then he goes and he shows you the details of that dispersion in Genesis 11, namely the Tower Babel. And so we look around and we see different nationalities. We see different people from different places. We go to the airport, or really anywhere these days, and hear languages that we're not familiar with. And so the Bible is seeking to give a historical account of how that came to be, and he points to Genesis 11. But there's something much more significant going on here than just a description of why we have nationalities. The question is, is why did God bring that about? What what was the motivation behind that? And when you get to Genesis 11, you find that we're in the cluster of Genesis, that's Genesis 4 through 11, which just followed the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve eating the fruit which they were not supposed to eat. And what I've explained to you several times over is that when they chose to eat from that fruit, it was a very significant choice. They were choosing that we will now be the ones who decide what is good, and we will now be the ones who decide what is evil. And so what happened was, is they assumed the place of God. We've got to understand that, that when we don't trust in the Lord with all our ways, and lean not on our own understanding, and in all our ways acknowledge him, and he will make our paths straight. When we choose to reject that, we are now choosing to be God. And we're choosing a path and pointing to this path as this is right and God's path is wrong. So in other words, when Adam and Eve ate from that fruit, they became competitors with God. That's the idea. So Genesis 4 through 11 shows you this is what life looks like when man chooses to be God. And obviously it culminates in the flood. It's awful. There's wickedness everywhere. Every single intent of the heart was evil all the time. So this is is the cluster of Genesis that we find ourselves in, and it actually crescendos with Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. What is man seeking to do in building this tower? Well, I'm going to argue that essentially... He's doing the very same thing that Adam and Eve did when they reached up to take from the fruit. They were assessing and trying to attain deity, to be on the same level with God himself is the idea. And I hope you see that at Journey's End. They're attempting to be in equal with God. Now, it's a little bit complex in how they're seeking to do that, but that's the idea. They want to be like God. God. But here's the catch. They don't want to be like God in reflecting his character. They want to be like God in competing with him, in equal. So there's two ways to be like God. You can be like God by reflecting his image and, and, and following him. And as you follow him and look up to him and admire him and love him and think he's the coolest thing, you'll actually be like him. But the other way to be like God is to compete with him. To say, yeah, God's got his route to joy, but I've got my route, and my route's superior. Now you're like God because you're trying to be a God, but you're not reflecting him. And so right from the get-go, right from the shoot in Genesis, he gives us three indications 
that them being like God is not a good thing. And what are those indications? Well, the first one is that in 11.2, he says they migrated from the east, from the east. Now, that may seem like a very insignificant detail, but you have to understand that people read a lot more intently than we do today. They listened a lot more intently than we do today. Our attention spans depleting, but they caught things like this. What did we hear last about people that came from the east? Well, you'll know that when God removed Adam and Eve from the garden, they came out of the east of the garden. So they're heading east away from the presence of God. So right from the get-go, you see that when someone's going east, your hair should stand up a little bit. It's not, it's not good. They're not going in a good direction because they're moving from the presence of the Lord. It's not just Adam and Eve that moved east when they got expelled. Cain, after he was judged by God, went east of Eden. John Steinbeck entitled one of his books, East of Eden. It's not just Cain that goes east of Eden. When Abraham and Lot are choosing land, Lot looks at a land and he says it was like the garden of God and it was to the east. So, we get this idea that man is moving to the east with a thought of getting back to, getting again in his own way, the Garden of Eden is the idea. So it carries some negative connotations. When you read that in Genesis 11, it should be an eerie note. They're migrating east. They're getting away from God. Second, on top of this, they do it in the land of Shinar. And this land is, is in the same vicinity as was the Garden of Eden. So you've got Noah getting off the ark, and you have man kind of locating somewhere in the same vicinity as the Garden of Eden. It's further away, but it's still in that area. And the author is sending a point. He's sending a message here. And he's saying, look, what man is trying to get back to is an Edenic place. They're trying to do it in their own way, but they're trying to get to Eden. And I want you to know that everybody on planet Earth is pursuing Eden right now. Do you know that? Because everybody on planet Earth right now is pursuing happiness. Everybody. Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, would say, even the man who hangs himself is, a, is trying to attain happiness. You say, how does that? Maybe he wants to punish someone who wronged him, and he knows that his suicide will send that message, and they'll forever have to live with the guilt of hurting him. Or maybe his, his circumstances have gotten so miserable, he sees that as the only pleasurable escape. But he's still seeking pleasure. And everyone on planet Earth, with every single decision they're making, they are pursuing Eden. They are pursuing pleasure. It's just a matter of how. How are you pursuing it? But that's what these individuals are pursuing in Genesis 11. So in a sense, this is Eden take three. Noah fell just like Eden take one. Now the people of Babel are falling take three. And what do I mean by falling? They're pursuing pleasure on their terms outside of God. And friends, you and I will get to do the very same thing. It's called sin. When we pursue any pleasure that's outside of God and his ways. Third, the author tells us that they settle, that they settled. And if you're reading thoughtfully through Genesis, you should know, you should understand that when you see the words settled, it should unsettle you. Because God told them, I want you to Fill the earth and multiply. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to go in every corner. Why? Why does he want them to go in every corner? Because they're made in his image. And just as an ancient king would set up a statue of himself in another land to say to those people that can't actually see him physically, say, hey, I'm your leader. Look at my statue. That's what I look like. I'm in charge of you. And this, this depiction is a reflection of me. So we were meant to be as men and women, reflections of God all across the globe. That was the idea of fill the earth and multiply. 
but they don't want to do that. They want to band together for security reasons. The flood probably scared them. They say, hey, we want to ensure that we're protected. So again, they're carving out their own route to security, peace, and happiness. That's the idea. It's fascinating what God calls fill, they call scatter. Do you see the different connotations? Doesn't fill sound like something good? Fill it up. That sounds like, oh yeah, that's a good thing. Scatter sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like somebody's coming in here with a gun. Everybody scatters. It's a bad thing. And that's how they look at filling. And it's fascinating how in a secular culture, things that we see as something good, the culture sees as something bad. Becky was just sharing with me her class from this morning's study on femininity and how so many areas of a woman's life that God intended for good, the world now calls evil. It's unbelievable. So God says, Phil, they say, Phil sounds like scatter to me. We don't like the scatter. Unbelievable. The next time we'll see the word settled is from Abram and his family, that they settled. But God comes to Abram, and you know what his first word is to Abram? Go. Go. I'm taking you away. And this is, this is something that we see in ourselves. Frequently, we have to battle the thought of just staying with our comfort people, right? That God calls us to go into all the world. Now, that might be into your neighborhood, but we're comfortable staying with our comfort people versus going out. This is what's going on here to a degree. So we want to ask, what is man after in this venture? Well, I've been hinting at it, saying it. They're after recreating Eden is the idea. Check this out. What did man lose when God removed them from the garden? What was it they lost? They lost two things. They lost access to God, number one. And they lost harmony with each other, number two. Those are the two things. How do we know they lost harmony? Well, the first two kids kill each other. Cain kills Abel. So they lost access to God, and they lost unity. What is Babel seeking to restore? Access to God, the tower, unity. It says they were one lip. And then it says very simply, their words, one. So just two words to describe the unity of mankind. One lip, words, one. In other words, they just, everybody was on the same page all the time. That's the idea. And now they get access to God, so they think. But here's the idea. Here's the scary part. They're seeking to do it because that's what you're doing too. That's what the world's doing too. Listen, if you think the world doesn't think they're okay with God, just look at statistics and how many people think they're going to heaven and how many people think they're actually going to hell. The whole world thinks they're okay after they die, mostly, the largest percentage. So the world doesn't just dismiss God. They include him in their package, but they just do it their way. That's how it works. And we do it ours. So what they're seeking to do is they're seeking to restore access to God. They're seeking to renew unity with man, but they're not doing it around the orbit of God. They're doing it around the orbit of themselves. They will accomplish it. They're not waiting on God to accomplish it. They're not calling on the Lord as do the descendants of Seth who call on the Lord. So they build a tower. What are these towers? Well, they're known as ziggurats, and the idea is they're essentially huge staircases that go around and around, sort of a square um, building, and it goes up and up and up and up. They've got this new technology, the brick, and they're seeking to do it. But what's it meant to illustrate? It's meant to symbolize a mountain, and it's meant to symbolize a mountain that goes up to the heavens. Essentially, the gods will live at the top is the idea access to God. These ziggurats were understood to be the center of the universe is what they would claim. The navel of the earth where God would meet with man. 
And it sounds so righteous. It sounds so good, noble, that they're trying to have access to God. But here's what I want to tell you. That wasn't ultimately what it was about. Because they want to achieve access to, me, to God. And when you have an achievement, that goes on your lapel. You say, that's something we accomplished. And this is why this account will say, what they were doing ultimately is building a what? Name for themselves. That's the thing. And if you think people can't build a name for themselves with religion... Just look no further than the Pharisees that love the long robes, that love their names called out, that love the best seats. Well, how do they get there? Religion. They climbed the ladder of religion. They made a great name for themselves through religion. They got glory through religion. And so they're seeking to make a name for themselves. And here's what's so fascinating. You need to catch this. Shem... In Hebrew, all it means is name. Shem. It's like someone had a child and they named him name. That's what it would be. His name is Shem. It's the word for name. And so I want you to catch this because it's so vitally important. You see, in Genesis 10, I made a big deal last time we were together about saying that Shem comes last in the genealogy and that the author of Genesis does that. He's very purposeful in doing that to show that I'm going to give you the genealogy of Japheth and Ham, but I'm going to end with Shem because here's what I want you to catch. Japheth and Ham, they're dead ends. They stop here. But Shem is a doorway, and he opens up to the next unfolding plan of God, namely Abram. And so I want you to catch the Shem. This is the idea, the name. I am going to continue a great name and that great name is God's, his own, and he's going to do it through Abram. So he's working with this idea of name, name, name. And so he says, I have a name that I want you to latch on to, and that name is Shem. Watch Shem. He's what we called last week the glory train. Watch me. Not because Shem's special in and of himself, but because I place my blessing on Shem, and it's through him that Jesus will come and remove every thorn. He'll, he'll lift up the valleys, he'll raise, bring down the mountains, he'll make everything smooth, he'll make everything perfect. So watch Shem as his family line unfolds. But the world hears that and they say, wait, God's got a name, we'll make a name. He's got somebody that he's with, we're going to match that somebody. So he's all concerned about Shem, well guess what, we can build a name too. And this is how we're going to build a name. Do you see, it's always options, it's always options. Man always presents an alternate option to the joy that's found in God. It's always there. There's always an opening. So you got to stay faithful to your wife, you got porn. The options. This is the way it works. They're competing, do you see? God's got a name. We'll work on that name. We'll work on ours. And we'll show you it's just as good. It might be counterfeit, but it's just as good. You see, God will take Abram and he says, I'll make your name great. But he'll make Abram's name great because Abram will be orbiting around God. And so his face will shine because God shines. But there's the people like Babel. Babylon will come to be a catchphrase. For it throughout the rest of the scriptures as any civilization that doesn't seek their joy in God. They're Babylon. They're Babylon-ish. I was up at Geshegumi Bible Camp this weekend for some meetings, and I got to room with one of my best friends from college, Tony Laidlaw. And Tony has lived in the Upper Peninsula now for about 10 years. And he described to me how hard it is, how hard it is to live in the Upper Peninsula. It's like winter eight months a year. And, you know, there's times when you live at the camp and you can't actually physically open your door because snow blew over the door and you can't get out. You have to call somebody to get you out of your cabin. And, and this is kind of the way it is um, at Getchigumi. And he said my first two years here, he said the winter came and I got the most 
unspeakable depression, just weeping without explanation. Didn't even think I could get out of bed to put my clothes on. Just it seemed like such a daunting task. And he said it finally, after the second year that it hit, right during winter, I just went to the doctor and I said, something is wrong with me. I don't know what's going on. I'm never like this and this is happening all the time. The doctor tested his blood and he says, you are unbelievably deficient in vitamin D. You're not getting sun. And so he puts him on a regu regulatory dose of vitamin D so that he can catch up with that sun. But I was talking to Tony about it. I said, man, that's hard. And he's like, oh, that's nothing. He said, imagine the miners that used to live here. They'd get up when it was still dark. They'd go down in the mine where there's no sunlight, and they'd come out, and it'd be pitch black. And they'd do that eight months a year. No sun. And I said, I wonder how it affected them. He said, oh, I know. They killed their wives. They became alcoholics. It's, uh, suicide was unbelievable. This is what it was. And friends, I say that to you as an illustration that man is seeking to orbit around himself. But what happens in that orbit is death and destruction. They're not getting the life source that they were meant to get, and so they just are depleted. It's just, I, I, I can't look any further than you've got movie stars and, and, and musicians, and they have everything that the world is pursuing, and yet we see suicide and early death and all these things in this realm that everybody's chasing. Divorce. It's because they're orbiting around a God that they've created on their own, and it will not satisfy. It will not make their faces radiant. But God will. You see, it's either we look for security and unity and wholeness and peace in God, or we seek it on our own, own terms. Man is seeking to restore the terror that happened in Eden. That's what's happening. But they're doing such a paltry effort at it. So helpful on the Prezi that they had this uh, uh, picture of Legos being built as a, as a building. Did you catch that on the thing? That was so helpful because that's how Genesis 11 pictures what these guys built. It's like chintzy. It's like us looking at Legos being built up. That's what it's like. This is what he says. Look, at, imagine, imagine, imagine. Catch Genesis 11. You've got to notice the irony that's going on here. Why did they build this, this tower? Well, they built it to knock on, the, on God's door. That's why they built it. They wanted to get up to God's door, making a great name for themselves in that way. But what does the author of Genesis say that God had to do? God had to come down. It's like, wait a minute. Weren't they supposed to get there? No. It's trivial. It's paltry can never make it to God. He's got to come down. It's what we call an anthropomorphism. Of course, God is everywhere, but he gives us images of himself that help us understand his relationship with us. So he says it comes down. The idea is there in Isaiah 40, 21 to 23. It says, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? This is God. What's sad here is that the people of Babel are essentially pursuing the same thing as Adam and Eve did, as I've mentioned before. They build this tower in the same way that Adam and Eve reached to take the fruit and eat it. They're seeking to do life without God on their own terms. God will have a place, but will be the center. The author of Genesis makes it clear that this picture in Genesis 11 is really indicative of what happened in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve fell. Look at Genesis 11, 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of Adam had built. 
He's saying, look, look, look. They're just like their dad. They're seeking to carve out a life of happiness where God is not in charge of how that works. They're seeking to do it. And I, I'm sad to tell you that you could be here right now doing the very same thing. You say, well, I'm at church. Aren't I in the right place? Yeah, you're in the right place. But where is this place in your life? How do you do life? Are you doing this right here on your terms, in your way? Or are you coming here to to add this to your repertoire? Or are you coming here, Ecclesiastes says, don't come to church to speak. Come to church to listen. That's the idea. Is this part of you shaping your life? Or is this part shaping you? That's the question. Someone asked G.K. Chesterton to write out his, orth- his, his what, orthodoxy, what he believed, his theology, and he said, I will not say that I made it, for I did not make it. God and humanity made it, and it made me. In other words, I'm being shaped by this. I'm not shaping it. So is God shaping you? Or are you just adding God to the rest of the happiness that you have at home and in this place and in this person and in this thing and this entity and in this position. And yeah, God's part of that. C.S. Lewis says this, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. So you got these people looking for happiness and peace in their own way. You know, friends, I can't tell you the amount of conversations that I've had with people that are in sin, catch this, in sin, clearly disobeying God's word, clearly, according to chapter and verse, which I read to them and say, look, the Bible says this is wrong and you are doing this. They will not say that God is not pleased with them. They'll say, we see it differently. We just see it differently. God's still with me, but we see that differently. See, God is still in their equation, but they're carving him out in their image to reflect their lifestyle. Where they're on top, ultimately. But I can talk about other people. Let's talk about us. I want to ask you this morning, What tower are you building? What tower am I building? And when I say, what tower are we building, what do I mean by that? What are you looking to to bring you peace? What are you looking to to bring you joy? Is it ultimately a reflection of yourself, or is it a reflection of God? Are you more excited about your life than you are what God's life is doing in in your life and other people's lives? Where do you get excited? What tower are you building? What are you looking to to make you whole? What is that? Let's just go through a few that we see in the scriptures. Because this isn't the first tower we see people trying to build in the scriptures. And I mean that figuratively. What are some other towers that people try to build in the scriptures to bring them security and peace and happiness? It could be reputation, success, greatness. I talked about the Pharisees who loved the seats in the synagogue, who loved the long robes, loved the power, the position, the authority. But what about us? Do you live for likes on your Facebook page? Statuses? Do you pursue being liked by all people and when you're not liked by all people, you can't have peace? People pleaser? Rich Mullins said this. He said, if your life is motivated by your ambition to leave a legacy, what you'll probably leave as a legacy is ambition. Let me hear that one more time. If your life is motivated by an ambition to leave a legacy, reputation, success, what you'll probably leave as a legacy is ambition. So fascinating 
when he says that Rich Mullins, halfway through his music career, left Nashville. It's like, as you know, the mecca for musicians. He left Nashville, where everything's done musically, and he goes out to New Mexico and teaches Indians on the reservation music. And yet, it's him who lives out in New Mexico in this obscure place that just recently, another musician did a tribute concert to Rich Mullins' songs. It's fascinating. Musicians would say, wait, you're leaving the place to leave a legacy. And yet, Andrew Peterson just a few weeks ago put on a whole concert, packed out, sold out, playing his, his album, A Liturgy, A Legacy, and a Ragamuffin Band. Because he had his face fixed on God, and he orbited around him, and as a result of that, God says, yeah, I'll keep playing his music, even after he's dead and gone. They'll keep hearing his music because it was all about me with him. We might seek security and peace through personal righteousness. At first, that sounds really good. But I want you to listen to this quote by novelist Flannery O'Connor. She says this. She says there was, she's describing one of her characters, and she says there was a deep, black, wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. Does that sound kind of warped? The way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. What does that mean? It means that in my righteousness, I don't need God. God can't tag me out because I'm perfect. And I don't need God because I'm perfect. And so these type of people will end up being the people that live very clean lives, but get all the attention for themselves for their clean life. Do you see? God does not get glory in that. move on some may pursue peace and security the tower they're building by avoiding risk and pursuing longevity avoiding risk and pursuing longevity we see this in the people that God calls us to risk things sometimes doesn't he in a sense we got to trust him to take care of it Going into the promised land seemed very risky for the people. And because they were avoiding what they determined as risk, and because they were pursuing longevity, the older ones, the one who didn't want to go in, were the only ones that actually died, and the young ones would go in. Or what about the lazy servant that everyone was given talents, but he buries his because he doesn't want to risk anything. I've felt convicted by God for some time now encouraged by God to, and for those of you who aren't on Facebook, to go live on Facebook, which is where you turn on your camera and you're live for everybody to see it. I felt like God is moving me to do this with some of the things we've been learning in Genesis. It's, it's kind of like Paul in the Areopagus where he just speaks the gospel to all with an earshot, and Facebook can serve as a good form to do that. But I got to tell you, I paced in my office for about two hours before I ever hit the button because it was so nerve-wracking for me. It was a risk. It's the most intimidating speaking moment of my life. But I want to get better at it. I want to keep pursuing it because I feel like at least right now God's calling me to do that on occasion. But it's a risk. It's scary. It's intimidating. But God will go with me just like he went with Abram. I don't want to be this lazy servant who buried his talent out of fear for what might happen. We might look for peace and security in wealth. That's the rich fool in Luke uh, 12 where he gets a surplus of wealth and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a couple more towers, build a couple more barns. And he says, I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. You see how that's his tower of Babel? It's his place of security. Jesus says, you fool, you're, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And you're not rich towards God. Why? Because his orbit was not going around God. He was carving out life on himself. But he probably factored God into it. He probably said, God's the one that gave me this surplus. Thank you, God. And then he built what he built. 
Not building his life around God, but God's in the equation very likely. And there really can't be a better example of someone like this rich farmer than Solomon himself. And he records that in the book of Ecclesiastes, that Solomon, effectively rich, richest man at that point ever in humanity, and he carved out for himself perfection. It says he built a garden very reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. He tried everything. He had wine. He had comedians. You know, you didn't have to go on YouTube to look up a comedian. He had them live near him. You just say, come over here. Make me laugh. Musician. He didn't have to listen to it on his listening device. He just had the bands there. He had them there. He had them all the time. He could have them play in different rooms of his house if he wanted. But the key word in Ecclesiastes is hevel which means vanity, vapor, a mist. It can't satisfy. When you try to carve out life on your own terms, it won't work. And so we see the goodness of God in this passage. Because what does God do? He comes down and he takes that one lip and he makes its hundreds of lips, thousands of He disrupts the language. Why? Because they're disrupting the route to joy. And God will not allow that route to be disrupted. He will keep that route an open highway for those that want. This is why Jesus says in Revelation, I knock at the door, and if any man opens it up, I'll come in and dine with him. That door is always open, and God will keep it open. And this is the idea. God isn't scared of what man can do. He's already sort of made fun of their tower by saying, I'm coming down. He's not intimidated by man. He's intimidated what man will do to the route of joy. And there is no joy outside of God. Amen? This is the idea. I want you to, I want you to get a picture of uh, a father being with his kids in, in, a, in a place that's busy, and in that place, he sees a teenager, and this teenager is with a group, and he's bragging on himself, and he's praising himself, and what he thinks is cool, the father knows really isn't cool, and it's not his teenager, it's just another teenager, but then he gradually sees that teenager, who is essentially making an idol out of himself, and looking for people to worship him, he moseys on over and gets next to this father's kids. And he starts talking to these young kids about his exploits and what he does and who he is. And essentially, he's in a recruitment mode, is he not? He's saying, look at me, worship me, do this. Would not a good father in that moment just subtly walk over by his kids and look at the teenager? And that teenager, if he's smart at all, will begin hushing up. Because he knows that the dad sees through his stuff. And that he's just a peon like everyone else. And pretty soon he'll walk away from the father's boys. And the boys will will not have to go down with that false idol. This is what God's doing at Babel. He's coming down and he's saying, this isn't the route. It's not where it's at. There's no happiness outside of me. So don't go their route. Don't go their way. That's why God is a jealous God, and people look at that as a bad thing. Jealousy is a good thing. If a man is trying to take another man's wife for his own use, there is a good jealousy in that woman's husband coming over and taking care of that situation. Joy isn't found that way. That's the idea. And so we come to a helpful verse in the scriptures that we hear often, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. You see, God has wired into humanity that when a person goes the way that's opposed to God, they will eventually fall. And God does that to help humanity, to redeem humanity, to keep them from saying this guy or this girl's path is the path to joy. Philip Yancey talks about the frequency in our culture 
where our culture lifts up certain lifestyles, whether it's drug use or free sex and free love, or whether it's now masculinity and femininity, and they, and they distort it and they twist it and they say, this is better. But we see the results. Philip Yancey says culture has to go back and self-correct and say, hey, we kind of, you know, we spoke a little too soon that time. This isn't the route to take. Because they're carving out life on their own terms. And friends, you and I can do the very same thing. We might be in the midst of it right now. But look at Matthew 5.5. 5. Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In other words, blessed is the one whose orbit is around God and not around their own carved out way. They will be happy. They will inherit the earth. Look at Psalm 61, 1 to 5. He says, hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer from the end of the earth. I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower. It's the same word used in Genesis 11. A strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. I've shared with you before the idea of vow. What a vow is in the Bible. And this sounds kind of strange maybe to us. But in the Old Testament, God let Israel have a deal. And this is how it works. If you have some crisis, if you have some nightmare that you're caught in, you can go to God and you can say, God, if you get me out of this crisis, I will give you this. In other words, a sort of tit for tat sort of relationship. If you give me this, I'll give you this. But and, and God, he stamped that his approval on that. He says, you can do that. But you know what Israel did? They did that offering all the time. But guess what? They never paid their vows. If you read thoroughly through the scriptures, you will find time after time again that God says, you're not paying your vows. Pay your vows. You vowed it, you pay it. Don't make a vow if you're not going to pay it. He says it every which way. And conversely, you'll find people who orbit around God, like David, throughout the Psalms, David will say to God, I pay my vows. I pay my vows. I am faithful to pay my vow. And you have to ask the question, does God need the three goats that David offered him, or the bull, or the ram, or the sheep, or the bird? What, did God need those things? And the answer is, is absolutely not. So why did God make that arrangement? Here's why he made the arrangement. It's this simple. When they came to God, they were completely destitute. Health issues, kid health issues, financial issues, they're just broken. They're, they're bankrupt. They have no hope. And so they come to God effectively like this. Destitute. And then God answers the prayer. He, he does his end. He does his thing. And here's the significance. The point of the vow was to say, when I pay those three goats, it was to say, God, I just want you to know, you fixed my problem. But my heart's still like this. I haven't gotten up from my knees. I'm still just as broken as I was before. But Israel never did that. Because look at God was part of their religion, but he wasn't the center. He, they were, it was a man-made religion that they brought him in like a genie to fix the situation. But then they stood up and they went back to building their tower. That's the idea of the vow. It was meant to show that I'm still broken. I still am relying on you with all my hope and my faith and my security for my peace and my harmony and my life. It's still on you. I'm not independent. I'm not autonomous again. I want you briefly to listen to a song by Rich Mullins. The words should be on the screen. And then I'll come back up uh, and close very briefly.
What's fascinating about this narrative in Genesis 11 is that it shows men building their way to God to hold him in their grasp. But what we'll find in Genesis 28 is that God actually comes to man instead of man going to him. Those who live by faith, those who wait on God's plan, God will visit them. And he comes to Jacob, and it says that there was a ladder or a stairway that went up to the heavens, just like the tower went up to the heavens, and the angels were ascending and descending on that staircase or that ladder. And it's there that God affirmed his promise to Jacob, the same one he made to Abram, that he will restore all things through his line. And for those who wait on God, for those who waited for God to do that, there would come a day where God wouldn't just have a ladder and speak with man. And Jacob goes as far as to say, I'm going to call this place Bet, which means house, and El, which means God. I'm going to call this place the house of God, Bethel. But there would come a day where God would actually come down to earth by sending his son who is in the exact image of God. And it's in his son Jesus that Jesus will meet a man named Nathaniel and he'll say to Nathaniel these words in John 151 truly truly I say to you you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. In other words everyone thinks they've got this way to God but I'm telling you that I am the way and for those that lived by faith they now see the way they'll have access to God God would make a way these people just didn't wait for it they did it their way according to their know-how and they carved it out themselves but God if you wait for God he will make it right even in every temptation you experience from day to day If you want to tell a joke that's inappropriate and you hold out on that joke, you'll find a greater joy later in the evening and say, I didn't tell it. Then you would have gotten from your friend's laughter. A greater joy, a greater satisfaction because Jesus promises us that the pure in heart shall see God. That's better than seeing your buddies laugh. You'll see God. Nothing can compare with that. So Jesus is our Emmanuel. He is our God with us. There's no towers necessary. There's no religion carved out necessary. Jesus comes and he is God with us. Amen? And when you have that relationship with Jesus, when your orbit is around him, you will say and be glad to say with the Apostle Paul, In Romans 15, 18, he says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. In other words, Paul says, look, I'm a guy just like you. I'm after joy just like you, but I'm going to tell you about the most superior joy. The most superior joy is knowing that God is with you and you're with God and God is working through you. When you experience God work through you, it's all you'll want to talk about. Because there's no higher joy. I'll ask the musicians to come, and as they do, I want to share with you, on the way back from Gichigumi, it's just such an enjoyable experience. The, the meeting, the annual meeting is always this time of year. And I get to drive up there, and I get to see our green and our fall starting, but then I get to get up to Gitche, and it's pretty much all fall there, and it's just absolutely gorgeous, and then I drive back, and I get to see fall all over again, go back, and now I'm here, and I'm going to get to see fall over again, so it's just like a win-win for me to get to see that, but it was a, it was a really wonderful moment when I realized and, and came to the knowledge that leaves, right now what you're seeing as fall ensues, you're actually getting to see the true color of the leaf. The green is not the true color of the leaf. It's the fall color that's the actual color of the leaf. It's just always filled with chlorophyll, which is green, and you don't see it. You don't see the true color. 
And what I want to say to you is that as long as you and I are seeking to live our lives with our own strength, we're like that green leaf. But the moment you begin orbiting around God and living out of God's strength for His glory, you will assume the image that you were always meant to carry. And it's much more of a beautiful image than the image of yourself and life the way you've carved it out to be. Amen? Please stand.